Good day and welcome to the Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouses, a new look at chronic and transient poverty using the Supplemental Poverty Measure webinar. Today's webinar is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Chris Moore, SSRC Technical Working Group Member and Senior Scholar at Child Trends. Please go ahead. Hello, everyone, and welcome today to today's Emerging Scholar webinar on a new look at chronic and transient poverty using the Supplemental Poverty Measure uh, by Sarah Kimberlin with Bill O'Hare as discussant. So I'm, I'm Chris Moore, Senior Scholar at Child Trends and a member of the SSRC team with ICF and the Urban Institute. I want to provide a very brief overview of the features of the SSRC before turning to Dr. Kimberlin. The Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouse is a virtual portal of research and other resources related to self-sufficiency. It functions as an online community for researchers, practitioners, and other stakeholders interested in self-sufficiency, employment, and family and child well-being. The purpose of the SSRC is to disseminate quality research. We currently have over 5,000 items in the library. On the left of this slide is a snapshot of the filters in the library. As you can see, you may filter through the collection by reference type, topical area, research methodology, and popular search terms, among others. We filtered research methodology to pull up a record of a thesis written by our current emerging scholar and today's speaker, Sarah Kimberlin, shown here. Well, the library consists of 12 topical areas that are listed in the drop-down on the right of this slide. Every topic area page under the Browse Topics tab includes an Our Librarian Recommends box that highlights research and resources recommended by the SSRC library team. Each topical area page also includes relevant federal laws and regulations. In this particular screenshot, you can see an example of an SSRC selection. SSRC selections highlight research, evaluation reports, and other publications that inform the field about key issues in and effective practices for fostering economic self-sufficiency and may be downloaded directly from the library. Well, turning to our selection criteria for emerging scholars, uh, they include that they should be a graduate student or a degree recipient with no more than 10 years of experience who's currently doing research on one of the self-sufficiency issues listed on the previous slide, and conducting high-quality research that fills a knowledge gap or addresses a self-sufficiency issue that warrants greater visibility. Emerging scholars, and this is an important thing to note, they may be working in academic, program, think tank, or agency settings. We're looking for people from varied backgrounds. This slide presents our 13 previous emerging scholars and illustrates the range of topics covered. Uh, ranging from family structure, job losses, immigrants, cost-effective analysis, and issues around incarceration. Our speaker today is Dr. Sarah Kimberlin, postdoctoral scholar at Stanford Center on Poverty and Inequality. Our discussant is Dr. William O'Hare, who is the former director of Kids Count at the Annie E. Casey Foundation. And please feel free to submit questions at any time through the question and answer feature at the bottom right of your screen. Questions will be answered after the presentation or if we run out of time via responses posted on the SSRC with other webinar materials after the event. Also, if you hear something during the webinar that you think others should know, tweet about it using hashtag SSRCWebinar. Tweets using SSRC Webinar will display on the left side of the screen. And now, thank you for joining. I will turn the mic over to Sarah Kimberlin. Sarah? Great. Thank you so much, Chris. I'm so happy to be here today to be able to present um, this information about a new look at chronic and transient poverty using the supplemental poverty measure. Um, just to give you an outline of what I'll be covering today, I'm going to be talking about new approaches to measuring poverty, specifically focusing on the supplemental poverty measure. Um, I will be particularly talking about extending the Supplemental Poverty Measure, or SPM, approach to examining poverty persistence, or how long people are poor over a number of years. 
Um, I'll show you some patterns of chronic or long-term and transient or short-term poverty under both the official poverty measure for the United States and in, under the supplemental poverty measure. Um, I'll talk a little more closely about the role of state government safety net benefits in reducing chronic and transient poverty. Um, I'll mention some questions that um, would be valuable for further research and talk about some of the policy implications of all of this. So to start with, um, just as some important background information, I want to talk about how we currently measure poverty in the United States. So the official government poverty measure for the United States um, is a measure that was developed in 1963 by Molly Arshansky of the Social Security Administration. Um, when she created this measure, she never really intended for it to become a, a long-term permanent approach to measuring poverty in the United States. She was aware that there were some major limitations to, um, to the measure, but it was the, the best that, she, that was, could be done with the data that was currently available at the time. Um, but there are a lot of problems with this official poverty measure, as I'll walk through in just a minute. So um, there was a, num a bunch of research done by many scholars, and particularly in the mid-1990s, um, and this coalesced eventually in 2010 in a new supplemental poverty measure for the United States that was announced by the U.S. Census Bureau and the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, and this new measure is designed to address a lot of the limitations of the official poverty measure. And so uh, I will walk you through now just how these two, the official measure is different from the supplemental poverty measure, or SPM. So the official poverty measure, that's the poverty threshold based on the 1960 patterns of food expenditures. So basically, Molly Orshansky um, looked at data at the time that showed that families spent about a third of their income on food. And then she looked at some other data that showed how much money it cost to provide a minimally adequate diet for a family. And she multiplied that food amount by three times to get the amount of money that you would need to be able to spend a third of your money on food and provide a minimally adequate diet. And then since then, that same number has just been updated for inflation over the years since then. Um, there are some problems with that, um, and the supplemental poverty measure tries to address those problems. So, I mean, the basic problem is that people don't spend a third of their money on food anymore. Food is much less expensive now, and housing is much more expensive. So um, just the bundle, the pattern of how people um, spend money on their basic needs for food, clothing, shelter, and utilities is just very different now. So supplemental poverty measure sets thresholds based on current spending on those basic needs for food, clothing, shelter, and utility, um, looking at over the past five years, um, how much have people actually spent on those among households that are in about the 33rd percentile of the, of the United States uh, spending on, on um, those, that bundle of goods. And that's how the poverty thresholds are set. So they're designed to reflect current patterns of spending and to stay updated over time as patterns may change. Um, what this results in, actually, is interestingly, the baseline thresholds are relatively similar. Um, under the official poverty measure, the threshold's about $24,000 for two adults plus two children. Under the supplemental poverty measure, it ranges from about $21,000 to $26,000, um, depending on whether you rent or own your housing, basically. Um, so the baseline thresholds are, tend to be a little bit higher under the supplemental poverty measure, but not drastically different. But there's another important aspect to the supplemental poverty measure thresholds that I'll cover next. Um, under the official poverty measure, the threshold is the same for all parts of the country. So whether you live in New York City or you live in rural Kansas, um, there's the same poverty threshold. Um, the problem with that is we know that the cost of living is very different, in, for example, rural Kansas versus New York City. So under the supplemental poverty measure, the threshold is adjusted for the very local cost of living across the United States. Um, and that means that in some parts of the country, like in California where I am, um, the, the threshold is much higher. And in other parts of the country where, uh, where costs are, are lower, then the, the threshold will be lower. Um, another important difference between these two measures is that under the official poverty measure, family is in terms of um, the people who are assumed to share income and to share expenses. Um, Family under the official measure is comprised of only those related by blood or marriage. Um, but we know family patterns have changed a lot in the years since the 1960s, and a lot of families now are cohabiting partners who are not married, um, as well as children of, of those cohabiting partners. So the supplemental poverty measure takes a broader view of family and includes those unmarried partners and their children, also includes foster children in, the, in a family unit. 
Um, one of the most important differences between the official measure and the supplemental poverty measure is how resources are accounted for. So under the official poverty measure, it only counts cash income, so the kinds of, kinds of income that you can, could deposit in your checking account. Um, and it does not, so that would include you know, your earnings, it would include your social security check, for example. There are other kinds of, of resources you might have that wouldn't be counted under that. And the official poverty measure also does not account for non-discretionary expenses. Um, it seems like all of the cash income you receive can be spent on your needs for food, clothing, shelter, and utilities. Under the SPM, in contrast, there's a much broader range of the kinds of resources that are counted. So it still counts all the cash income, so your money from your wages or your investments, as well as um, things like your Social Security check or your SSI check. Um, but it also counts other kinds of resources that don't get counted under the official measure. So for example, if you get a refundable tax credit, like the Earned Income Tax Credit, that is counted towards your resources under the SPAN, but not under the official measure. And if you get other kinds of benefits that can be used for basic needs, like food stamps or housing subsidy um, or help with your energy bills, um, that also is counted towards your resources under the SPAN, which doesn't show up in the official measure. The SPM also subtracts non-discretionary expenses from your resources. So the idea here is that if you have to spend money on a medical bill or if you have to spend money on child care in order to work, then that money is not available to help you pay for your housing or your clothing or shelter. Or your, um, and so we shouldn't count that income um, when we're comparing your total amount of resources to whether you have enough to meet the poverty threshold. So all of these changes between the official measure and the supplemental poverty measure um, produce a slightly different picture of poverty in the United States when you look at it on an annual basis. Um, and so these numbers I'm showing you now are drawn from the census um, report on uh, the supplemental poverty measure. This is the date, data for 2014. So um, what you see right now, this is, these are the official, the poverty rates under the official um, annual, um, the official poverty measure. So for the overall population, about 15% were poor in 2014. Children have a higher rate at about 22%, and seniors have a lower rate at about 10%. Um, when we look at the supplemental poverty measure, looking at the, the same year, we see actually that for the overall population, it looks pretty similar. It's very slightly higher at about 15% are poor when we um, measure poverty using the SPM. But there are big, big differences for different age groups. So for children, you see that their poverty rate looks much better under the SPM. It's just a little bit higher than the overall population. Seniors, it actually looks quite a bit higher um, under the SPM. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about what's driving some of these differences. Um, so just to summarize, the differences in overall annual official poverty and SPM poverty are not very large. But there are differences by age group that are substantial, particularly poverty is lower for children and higher for seniors under the SPM. And this reflects the current safety net focus in our country on uh, families with children. So there are a lot of benefits like the EITC um, and nutrition programs that are strongly directed towards families with children. And it's also um, driven by the high out-of-pocket medical costs that seniors face. Now, that's important background on the, the improvements of the SPM um, in terms of addressing some of the limitations of the official poverty measure. But um, most of the work on the SPM so far has focused on looking at poverty in just one year at a time. And I want to talk about adding the dimension of time. So annual poverty is important. I mean, knowing how many people are poor in a given year is important. But it doesn't tell us about poverty persistence across multiple years or whether people end up being poor for a short time or if they end up being poor for most of the time. Um, so the research objective for this work is to expand our improving understanding of poverty to a new dimension, looking at the persistence of poverty over time, and applying the SPM to present a new look at chronic or long-term poverty and transient or short-term poverty in the United States. Um, so next, let me talk about why, why this is an important thing to do. So why does poverty persistence matter? What are the differences between transient or short-term poverty and chronic or long-term poverty? So transient poverty, um, this is people who pop into poverty for a short period and then pop out. Um, so they might be poor just for a year or two, or they might be poor and then come out of poverty and go in again at some point later. But in general, most of the time they're not poor. They're just poor once in a while. Um, this kind of poverty affects a relatively large share of the population. 
and it's typically associated with a short-term drop in income. So a very typical situation would be someone in the family loses a job, so their income goes down for that year, but then they get a new job and their income goes back up. Um, and this kind of poverty is associated with negative life, life outcomes in terms of poor health, poor mental health, um, educational um, outcomes, and those kinds of things. But chronic poverty, and this is, again, people who are long-term poor. So most of the time they're poor. They might come out of poverty once in a while. They might never come out of poverty, but most of the time they're poor. This affects a very small share of the, of the total population, but it's actually a large share of the poor, people who are poor in any given year because, um, because they're always in that annual poverty number. They don't come out of it very quickly or very often. Um, chronic poverty is associated with a long-term inability to achieve self-sufficiency. So someone, this is, um, they just don't have the, the um, ability to get their income above the poverty line on a regular basis. Um, and this is, not surprisingly, associated with much l worse life outcomes in terms of poor health and poor education, educational outcomes, and um, all those different kinds of things. Um, and what this means is that it's really relevant to consider chronic poverty and transient poverty separately. They affect a different share of the population in terms of how many people they affect. Um, they are associated with different kinds of um, triggers pushing people into the, these different kinds of poverty. Um, and they're associated with different kinds of life outcomes. Um, so let me talk about the data that I am using to explore these issues. Um, this research draws on data from the Nationally Representative Panel Study of Income Dynamics. Um, this is a survey that's done every other year um, and um, asking people questions about their income and their expenses and other sort of demographic information. Um, so the research I'm presenting to you today um, draws on data from 1998 to 2008. But since it's every other year, that gives you six years of data across this 11-year time frame. And this time frame is, is relevant because it's um, representative of the post-welfare reform policy context in the United States. So it starts after welfare reform was fully implemented in 1998 and goes up to just the very start of the, of the Great Recession before the full effects of the Great Recession had really set in. Um, the analytic sample I'm using here is 10,210 individuals. So that's the, the number of cases in the data. Um, the basic strategy is to partition the poor population into the chronic poor, um, here defined as those who are poor in more, of half, more than half of the years examined um, compared to the transient poor. And those are individuals who are poor at least one of the years, but not more than half of the years. And then um, examine chronic poverty or long-term poverty and transient poverty or short-term poverty um, using both the official poverty measure and the supplemental poverty measure. And I should say um, this, this uh, research I'm presenting here, she uses the time period 1998 to 2008 and defines chronic poor as poor in more than half of the years. But the numbers are, um, it, it can be you know, somewhat arbitrary, the time frame you choose. Uh, these numbers look very similar if you look at seven years of data instead of six years of data, and the patterns also look very similar if you define chronic poor as poor in three or more years instead of four or more years. So um, the precise numbers are, are perhaps less important than the, than the broad patterns that I'll be showing you. Um, and let's go. Um, so let's take a look at um, how poverty breaks down under official poverty versus supplemental poverty over time. So this, um, this pie chart here shows you only the, of the individuals who are poor at least one of the years in, this, um, in the data. And you can see under official poverty, um, there's sort of a declining amount. So the largest number of people are poor for only one year, and then a slightly smaller for two years, slightly smaller for three years, and four years, and so on. Um, and we see a somewhat similar pattern with the supplemental poverty measure, but you'll notice it's sort of exaggerated. So Again, the largest number of poor is poor for, or poor for only one year, but that's a much larger share than compared to under official poverty. Um, and again, there's a declining number of people in each category, but um, overall, under the SPM, um, more people are poor for a short period of time and fewer people are poor for a long period of time. And this is just a way of looking at the same data. If we t when we define transient poor as poor, um, in at least one year, but not more than half of the years, and chronic poor is poor in more than half of the years, you can see that there's a larger share of people who are chronic poor under the official poverty measure. Under the SPM, there's a smaller share of the poor who are chronic poor. So looking at how this translate into, translates into poverty rates, 
So looking across these, these six years of data, if we look at all the people who are poor in at least one year, under the official property measure, it's about 24% of the, of the people are poor in at least one of these years. Um, but that breaks down differently if you look at short-term poverty versus long-term poverty. So a, a larger share of those are transient poor or short-term poor, and a smaller share are chronic poor or long-term poor. Um, and then let's look at what that looks like when we use the supplemental poverty measure. Now you'll see that the number of people who are poor in at least one year is very similar under the STM, it's about 24%. But the patterns are different in terms of transient versus chronic poverty. So you can see that transient poverty is more common under the SPM, and chronic poverty is less common under the SPM. So about one in five people is transient poor, and only about one in 35 is chronic poor. Now remember, under when we looked at poverty for just one year at a time, annual poverty, there were important differences between official poverty and SPM poverty for different age groups. And that's true when we look across time as well. So here I show, we show the, the official poverty transient um, poverty rates for children and for seniors. Um, you'll see children have a higher transient rate and seniors have a lower transient rate under the official poverty measure. Now, under the supplemental poverty measure, children have a pretty similar transient poverty rate. It's a little bit lower. Seniors have a much higher one, quite a bit higher under the SPM. And when we turn to chronic poverty, we'll see, again, under the official measure, Children have a little bit of a higher chronic poverty rate than seniors. When we look under the SPM, chronic poverty for children drops quite a bit. And chronic poverty for seniors also drops somewhat, although not as much. So you can see the patterns um, look very different for official poverty versus SPM poverty um, when we look at different age groups. So just to summarize, again, under official poverty, chronic poverty is substantially less common than transient poverty. Children have higher than average chronic poverty and transient poverty, and seniors have lower than average chronic and transient poverty. But the SPM is arguably a better approach to measuring poverty, and we see that transient poverty is more common, common under the SPM than under official poverty, while chronic poverty is less common. And there are pronounced differences by age groups. So children have much lower chronic poverty under the SPM, and seniors have much higher transient poverty under the SPM. So um, and in just a minute, I'll talk about what's driving some of those differences. But first, just briefly, I'd like to turn to deep poverty. So this is poverty that, um, where families have income or resources less than half of the poverty threshold. Um, and we'll see, again, there are differences between, between official and SPM poverty when we look at deep poverty. So for the overall population, this is showing official deep poverty for the overall population. You see um, about 11% of individuals are in transient deep poverty, so they pop into deep poverty for one to three years of this time period. And a very small percentage, 1.2%, is chronically deeply poor. So in more than half of the years, they are below half of the poverty threshold. Again, this is the official threshold. Now, when we look at the supplemental poverty threshold, deep poverty doesn't look quite as bad under the SPM. So um, transient deep poverty is a little bit lower at 10%, and chronic deep poverty almost disappears. Um, but we should look at different age groups, too, because we know the differences um, between these two ways of approaching poverty look different for different age groups. So under the official poverty measure, children have higher rates of transient and chronic deep poverty. But when we look at the SPM, um, transient deep poverty for children drops to almost by half, and chronic deep poverty like, essentially disappears for children under the SPM in this data. Um, looking at seniors, again, we'll see that um, seniors have sort of modest, uh, higher than average rates of deep chronic poverty and a little bit lower than average deep chronic poverty under the official poverty measure. Um, but their deep transient poverty is quite a bit higher under the SPM. And again, chronic deep poverty is really not as much of a problem when we look at poverty using the SPM. So just again, to summarize, age differences when we look at deep poverty are even more stark. Um, children have substantially lower transient and chronic deep poverty under the SPM. And seniors have higher transient deep poverty under the SPM. So, um, it's possible to look at the data to sort of find out why are the differences, why are there differences in transient poverty and chronic poverty when we use the SPM versus when we use the official poverty measure. And the differences are driven by the way that resources are counted in the SPM. So um, remember under the SPM, 
um, ex uh, expenses spent on things like medical out-of-pocket expenses or other kinds of non-discretionary expenses are subtracted from resources before um, those resources are compared to the poverty threshold. So for seniors, the, S the SPM excludes medical out-of-pocket expenses, and those disproportionately affect seniors. And if medical expenses are not subtracted from resources, then you can see that the SPM transient poverty rate looks more similar to the official transient poverty rate. For children, um, the difference is driven by the fact that the SPM includes a bunch of non-cash benefits that are not counted under the official poverty measure. Um, and these are benefits that particularly benefit families with children, so especially refundable tax, tax credits like the EITC and also food stamps and other kinds of nutrition programs um, that particularly benefit families with children. If we don't count these non-cash benefits in resources, then SPM chronic poverty looks very similar to official chronic poverty for children. And let me show you that visually. So this is data for seniors. So again, this is what um, transient and chronic poverty look like for seniors under the official measure. And this is what um, transient and chronic poverty look like for seniors under the supplemental measure. But now if we take the supplemental measure and we don't exclude medical expenses, then it looks like this, which again looks much more similar to official poverty for seniors. Now turning to children, um, this is what transient and chronic poverty look like under the official poverty measure for children. And this is what they look like for children under the SPM. Again, remember, chronic poverty is much less for children under the SPM. Now, if we don't include those non-cash benefits like the EITC or food stamps, then um, this is what S SPM poverty looks like for children. Again, it looks a lot more similar to official poverty, actually even a little bit higher than official poverty. So um, speaking of programs like the EITC and food stamps, um, it's really relevant to think about um, the role of the full range of government safety net programs. So those kinds of non-cash benefits that aren't counted in the official measure, but also cash benefits like Social Security or SSI. Um, it's relevant to examine the influence of the full range of government safety net programs on chronic and transient poverty. And here, uh, I will show you data using just the SPM, um, because one of the great benefits of the SPM is that it includes a very comprehensive set of benefits, so it really facilitates the project of looking at how the full range of benefits affect uh, poverty. So first, I just want to review all of the safety net benefits that are included in the SPM. I mentioned these a little bit um, earlier, but to go very specifically into which programs are counted. So the SPM includes refundable tax credits, so federal and state um, EITC, as well as um, the additional child tax credit. It includes social insurance benefits, like Social Security, unemployment insurance, worker compensation. And it includes means-tested programs or public assistance programs, so programs like food stamps, school meals, WIC, uh, energy subsidies, housing subsidies, as well as programs like Supplemental Security Income or SSI and Cash Welfare TANF. So this, um, this graph shows you um, just the, the basic transient and chronic poverty rates that we've talked about uh, already um, when, um, when we use the full supplemental poverty measure. So again, about 21% of, of individuals are transient poor and about 3% are chronic poor. Now, when we, if we don't count all of the different kinds of government benefits that people receive over those years, then you'll see a dramatic increase in the chronic poverty rate and a, a modest increase in the transient poverty rate. So this is what the poverty rate um, would look like over this time period if we subtract all of the government support that people received during that time period. Then you would see about 12% of people would have been chronic poor if they, we don't count any of those government resources and about 25% would have been transient poor. And again, um, I want to show you the data for different age groups because we know the differences are, um, the poverty rates look different for different age groups. So again, these are the basic SPM transient and chronic poverty rates for children. Now, if we don't include all of the government resources that uh, those children received, then again, you see a very dramatic increase in the chronic poverty rate and a small increase in the transient poverty rate. And looking at seniors, um, again, these are the basic rates of transient poverty and short-term and chronic poverty for seniors under the SPN. If we don't include all the different kinds of government support that seniors receive, 
see a really dramatic increase in chronic poverty and a small increase in transient poverty. Um, and this is really driven by uh, Social Security in the case of seniors. So again, to summarize, safety net programs collectively reduce transient poverty by about one-sixth and chronic poverty by about four-fifths, meaning that if we subtract all the government support that people receive over that time period, we see a dramatic increase in chronic poverty and a modest increase in transient poverty. And there are important age group effects. So the large effect for children is due to tax credits plus nutrition programs that have an especially large impact on chronic poverty. And the large effect for seniors is due to Social Security. And again, it has an especially dramatic effect on chronic poverty. So um, one of the things that happens with this um, when we look at um, the role of safety net programs in poverty status um, is that safety net benefits shift some individuals out of chronic poverty and into transient poverty. So to show you this visually. Um, we look at all the people who are chronic, transient, or non-poor just based on the resources they have um, that they produce themselves, so not, not, any, not counting any of the government support they might have. So this is just based on um, what they have from their wages or from their investment income or self-employment, those kinds of things. Now, when we add government resources, so things like um, Social Security, but also things like housing subsidies or the Earned Income Tax Credit, all different kinds of support from the government. When we add government support, this is what happens. Um, about 11% of individuals shift from transient poor to non-poor. About 4% of individuals shift from chronic poor to non-poor. And about 7% of individuals shift from chronic poor to transient poor. So they would have been poor most of the time um, if we don't count government support in their resources. And when we add those government programs in, then they're still poor once in a while, but they're not poor most of the time. So another way of thinking about this is that among the people who are transient poor, who are poor you know, for some time, but not most of the time, about a third of them would be chronic poor if we don't count any government safety net benefits. Um, there are some questions that this research raises that require some further investigation. So one of the issues, we know that government benefits are underreported in survey data. So some people receive benefits, they, they don't say that they receive them, or they say they receive less than they actually received. So um, that would suggest that the true influence of safety net programs on poverty rates might be larger than the numbers I'm showing you here. Um, on the other hand, we also know that safety net programs have behavioral effects that um, can produce incentives or disincentives for employment, and these can increase or decrease poverty reduction. So for example, um, we know that um, knowing that the earned income tax credit is out there, people know that if they can get a job and work some hours, they can also get the earned income tax credit. And there's research showing that, um, that in fact, more people work more hours um, when they have the earned income tax credit available to them. So what that means is if you actually got rid of the EITC, you would have both the, the loss of resources from the EITC itself, but also you would see some, some people wouldn't be working as much as they did um, knowing that they could get an EITC uh, refund. And so you would see an actually a greater drop in, um, a greater increase in poverty if you actually eliminated the EITC because people would lose both the amount from their tax credit, but they also wouldn't have earned as much in wages. Um, and similarly, um, if you have a public uh, a housing subsidy, usually the way your rent is calculated is as 30% of your income approximately. So that means if you earn more income, you have to pay a higher rent. Um, so that means that some people receiving a housing subsidy are, gonna, are likely to work fewer hours. Um, so if you actually got rid of housing subsidies, you would see um, not as much of a decrease uh, not as much of an increase as poverty because some of those people who um, who had a subsidy would in fact work more hours. So basically what this means is the numbers here are a little bit different from what you would see if you actually eliminated, say, housing subsidies or the EITC or food stamps or um, whatever, because you have to account for the, the way people would react to the actual elimination of those programs. So further research that looks a little bit more at those kinds of behavioral effects would be valuable. Um, and then the final thing, I, a question that I want to raise is just that it is complex to understand the high senior poverty under the SPN. High senior poverty is driven by high out-of-pocket medical expenses, but it's important to know how seniors are supporting those expenses 
some seniors have savings that they have saved during their working life that they were planning to spend on those kinds of expenses in their old age. If they're spending those uh, savings down in a sustainable way, then it may not be too much of a problem if they have a high medical expense that makes them look like they're poor. On the other hand, we know a lot of um, low-income seniors really don't have a lot of substantial savings, and so uh, a year with high medical expenses is a real problem for them. So just understanding more about how people, how seniors are spending, finding the money to spend on their medical expenses is important to understand. And just in general, understanding for seniors um, income and wealth at the same time when thinking about poverty would be valuable. Um, so let me talk a little bit about some of the policy implications of this work. The, the broad message, I think, here is that <clears throat> it's very useful to apply different approaches to analyzing poverty and to analyzing the impact of policy on poverty. So here I've showed you some what happens when we look at poverty using the supplemental poverty measure, when we look at it by age group, and when we think about chronic or long-term poverty versus transient or short-term poverty. And I think what all of these different approaches do is it breaks down the problem of poverty and shows us that different populations are affected in different ways, that policies are infecting different people in different ways, that policies are having different effects over the short term and over the long term. Um, it just provides more ways of thinking about the problem of poverty, which um, makes, you know, suggests more ways about tar to target policies and to think about addressing the problem of poverty. Um, the results also show that the safety net is keeping a substantial share of the population, including especially vulnerable children and seniors, out of chronic poverty and out of chronic deep poverty. Like when you use the SPM and you account for the full range of safety net benefits that we currently um, have in play in this country, um, you can see that um, those safety net benefits are doing a pretty good job of keeping people out of chronic poverty and chronic deep poverty especially. And this is important because we know that chronic poverty and especially chronic deep poverty is associated with the worst life outcomes. So that is good. Um, it also shows that the remaining chronic poor population is very small, which suggests it might be financially and practically feasibly to address the problem of chronic, problem of chronic poverty through policy intervention. Um, however, I do want to highlight as well that um, even after we account for a broad range of safety net programs using the SPM, um, the overall data shows that about one in four individuals was poor in at least one a year over the six years examined. Um, and that's a pretty high rate, which just shows that under our current economic and safety net system, poverty is a fairly normative American experience that many people, many people, if we look over a period of, of a decade or longer, can expect to experience poverty at some point during that time. That's much higher, of course, than the number of the share of people who experience poverty in any given year, which is what we see when we look at annual poverty rates. Um, I just want to acknowledge some of the important people and um, organizations that have helped me with this research. Great. And say thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, very important. And I want to uh, remind listeners that you can submit questions um, through the question and answer feature at the bottom right of your screen. Um, and also, if you hear something or heard something during the webinar you think others should know, please tweet about it using hashtag SSRCWebinar. And now I want to turn to our discussant, Dr. Bill O'Hara. Thanks, Chris. I'm just checking. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks, Sarah, for a very engaging and informative uh, presentation uh, with lots of good detailed information. I don't have much to say about any of the details. I'd like to take my time to underscore a couple of the major points that uh, Sarah made in her presentation and then offer an additional comment at the end. And I should preface this by noting that my interest is in children and particularly uh, call myself a database child advocate that is using good data and research to improve the lives of children. So that perspective uh, may slant a little bit what I'm focused on here. Uh, the first thing I want to uh, applaud is the use of this length of poverty or chronic and transient poverty measure here in your study. I think too often uh, we look at snapshots of poverty and this uh, looking at chronic and transient poverty, what I call the length of poverty, is a much more important but undermeasured aspect of poverty. In fact, in, in my mind, there are three 
aspects of poverty that are undermeasured and underreported. The first one is the depth of poverty. I think it makes a difference for a child whether their family is one dollar under the poverty threshold or whether their family only has a couple thousand dollars of income, the depth of poverty. The second one is the concentration of poverty. That is, I think it makes a difference where a child lives in a neighborhood with lots of other poor families and poor children or whether a child lives in a neighborhood with very few poor families or poor children. And then the third one is this one we explored here today, length of poverty. I'll just note that those first two dimensions, depth of poverty and concentration of poverty, can be gleaned from Bureau, uh, Census Bureau data, uh, but the length of poverty cannot. So I think that's another reason why this study and this kind of study is particularly important. I don't know if there's any, but I know there's a few other data sets besides the PSID, but there are probably none better than the PSID for exploring this topic. The second uh, aspect of the study that I want to applaud is the use of the supplemental poverty measure. For those of you who have been around for a while, you know this has been a long slog from uh, the, the early 80s or in the 70s when people started talking about this mismeasurement of poverty to where we are today with a supplemental poverty measure. And it's moving in the right direction, but we still have a little way to go, I think. Um, I don't think there's any, there is no question in my mind that the supplemental poverty measure is conceptually a better measure of poverty than the OMB measure or the Oshansky measures sometimes called. And for me, there's two obvious reasons why that's true, which are not only important uh, substantively in, in scholarly terms, but also, fortunately, easy to explain to people who may not be uh, people who study poverty or how we measure poverty. One, and both of these were mentioned by Sarah, I'm just repeating kind of what she said, but the first one is the fact that non-cash benefits are included in the SPM. And something in the neighborhood of two-thirds or three-quarters of all the means-tested benefits that we give out, the government gives out, are non-cash benefits. So including them in the measure of poverty makes sense. It also helps show the impact, the anti-poverty impact, of those government programs which are overlooked in the OMB measure. The second uh, aspect, I think, that makes the SPM conceptually better is the incorporates the variation in cost of living. As Sarah noted, it costs a lot more to live in New York or Washington or San Francisco than it does in the rural south or other parts of this country. And the fact that the SPM takes those things into consideration is an important addition to making it a better measure of poverty. The last comment I just want to talk about is a trade-off that a lot of us in the advocacy community and public policy uh, and public analysis, policy analysis community face, and that is right now the SPM is only available nationally for children or at the state level for the total population. And that presents a problem for, uh, particularly for child advocates and for people studying state policy. As you may know, uh, state, state governments are a much more important actor for children's policy than for elderly policy. Uh, there's a big variation in things like per pupil expenditure, TANF benefits, Medicaid eligibility, all kinds of programs differ in very important ways across the state. And that's not true for, um, for elderly. In fact, uh, obviously, Social Security and Medicare are uh, the primary programs and they're pretty consistent across the states. Uh, and so for us, it's a, it's a problem because we think the SPM is a better measure of poverty, but we don't have it for children at the state and sub-state level. So, a long story, a little bit shorter. Uh, I talked to, contacted Kathy Short of the Census Bureau to make sure I wasn't missing something about the availability of SPM for children at the state level. And she reminded me that uh, on the IPUMS website at the University of Minnesota, or IPUMS, there is uh, the availability of the current population survey from 2010 to 2013, which has uh, poverty measures, both the SPM and the OMB measure, for everybody. And so I took those uh, calculated poverty rates for children under both those measures, SPM and OMB, and uh, at the, the national level, they show the same kind of relationship that uh, Sarah showed here, that the, the SPM poverty measure is about four or five percentage points lower than OMB. But there's a lot of variation across the states in that. Uh, to just present a couple of summary statistics, the correlation across the states for those two measures is 0.69. You should call that a moderate positive correlation, but not as high as I would have expected. And obviously, there are some important differences across some states. 
The other measure I'll just mention that there were about a third of the states, Rebecca, also ranked the states based on the poverty measure, and about a third of the states moved by 10 ranks or more, some of them by 20 or 25 ranks. So if you're trying to get a picture of child poverty across the state, it makes a big difference on which of these measures one uses. Just to show the extremes on, on that, uh, Mississippi, the OMB measure says 30% of kids are poor, but the SPM measure says only 17% are poor. I suspect that's related at least part to the lower cost of living in Mississippi and probably to a lot of kids being on uh, some kind of welfare programs. On the other hand, in California, the OMB measure shows 23% in poverty and the SPM measure shows 27% in poverty. I suspect that's at least partly related to the high cost of living in California and perhaps a uh, high immigrant population who are not getting welfare benefits. But the point here is that it would be that there are big differences in the state uh, between the SPM measure and the OMB measure. It would be nice to have uh, an SPM measure that goes not only for states but for sub-states uh, areas. So let me summarize this way. I think it was a great study. It's a lot of detailed information to our understanding of poverty. I think it was particularly important using the length of poverty uh, to assess uh, uh, well-being and poverty. Secondly, the impact of government benefits from the SPM were important to note. And finally, the last point I just made is that it would be really, it's really important to get a supplemental poverty measure at the state level. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. That was very uh, helpful. Um, because many people were not able to join right at the beginning, um, we are going to extend this uh, conversation. We have a lot of questions um, for five or possibly ten minutes after if, for people who are able and would like to stay. Um, so, Sarah, you might want to respond to Bill's comments, but also there are a number of questions about uh, the SPM, some from people who missed uh, the beginning. Um, if you could just do a really quick summary of how the SPM is, is calculated. Sure, a quick summary of how the SPM is um, calculated. Um, sure, I'll do that and then I can respond to Bill's comments if that, if that works. Um, so the SPM is calculated in this way. So first of all, um, you, they, you start with the SPM threshold. The thresholds are calculated by looking at um, how much do people usually spend on food, clothing, shelter, and utilities um, across the United States based on survey data. Um, for, for families that are in a, uh, at the 33rd percentile of the, of the distri distribution of, of expenditures. So, I mean, people who are a little bit below average in terms of how much they spend on their um, basic needs, how much do those people spend on that bundle of basic needs? And that's um, where the poverty threshold is set. And then the next thing that happens with the threshold is those are adjusted for the cost of living in each local area. So it'll go down in areas with a low cost of living. It'll go up in areas with a high cost of living. Um, and then it's also adjusted for the number of people in the family. So that's the threshold. And then that threshold is compared to the amount of resources that, that a family has. So, and the resources that a family has under the SPM are calculated in this way. So first, um, you take all of the resources that families have in terms of their cash, so everything that they've earned at their jobs or that they have from investments and cash benefits that they, um, that they get from the government, like Social Security or um, SSI. Then you also add to that um, other kinds of non-cash benefits that people get from the government to pay for their basic needs. Um, so things like food stamps, housing subsidies, school lunch, um, all those kinds of programs. And then, then you take that amount of resources and you subtract from it the, the expenses that people have to pay before they can pay for food, clothing, shelter, and utilities. So you subtract like the cost of childcare that people need to pay for in order to work. You subtract um, there are other kinds of work expenses like their commuting costs and you subtract their medical out-of-pocket expenses. So that gives you the final amount of money that or sort of total resources that a family should theoretically have to be able to pay for their basic needs. And you compare that to the threshold and see if they're above the threshold, you say that they are not poor. If they're below the threshold, like their resources are less than that threshold, then you say that they're poor. Um, so that's the, the basic construction of the, of the supplemental poverty measure. Um, just to briefly respond to some of um, some of Bill's comments, um, I definitely would agree that um, thinking about other aspects of poverty besides just whether someone is poor or not, so depth of poverty and concentration of poverty, um, as well as persistence of poverty, are again key ways of thinking about the problem of poverty and suggesting you know where where there might be areas that need more attention and um, 
how our policies are affecting different aspects of poverty. So I think that's important. Um, in terms of the state-level state, state level measures, um, I wanted to mention, I know that the Census Bureau has released at least one um, report on STM poverty at the state level that uses that current population survey data. So that's available on their website. Um, and I know they're also, in terms of, for the research community, they're um, working on developing a, a measure of poverty in the American Community Survey, so that will make, um, that's still in progress, but when that becomes available, that will make um, analysis of poverty at smaller, um, in smaller areas possible, so at county level estimates. Right now, uh, there isn't the data available to make county level estimates of SPM poverty, except for in a few states where research organizations have done that. So at Stanford, we um, have a California poverty measure that, that looks at that. New York City has a, a poverty measure as well. Um, it provides those kind of smaller area estimates, but for the nation as a whole, that's still in development right now. A number of questions coming in um, about that, so we will have to post some of those resources um, when the slides are posted. I'm also getting a number of questions um, about data by race, ethnicity. Have you looked at that, Sarah? I have, yeah, and um, so I have a slide that we can show here. Um, it's definitely interesting to look at differences by race, ethnicity, too. This is another example of um, when you break down poverty by different categories and look at different populations, um, you see a different picture. So um, this shows the, the transient poverty rates and chronic poverty rates broken down by race and ethnicity. And I want to note the, um, the sample sizes for some of these groups are relatively small in the PSID data. And so that's why you see, you see those bars, those show that the real number is somewhere in the range covered by those bars. So this is the best estimate in the data, but um, we don't know it precisely um, using these data because there's not as many Hispanic individuals in the data set as there are for the overall population, for example. But you can see um, you know, some things definitely stand out um, in this data. Um, Hispanic and black households have extremely high, or, or individuals in Hispanic and black households have extremely high rates of transient poverty. Um, and uh, individuals in Hispanic households also stand out for very high rates of chronic poverty in this uh, data set um, among households, um, among white households, uh, transient and chronic poverty are much lower. Um, that last bar is actually immigrant households or households headed, headed by someone who immigrated to this country um, after 1968, so relatively recent immigrants, and again, you can see that they have also very high rates of transient and chronic poverty in this data. So um, yes, I think the differences by race and ethnicity are definitely important. Thank you. Um, another question um, a listener asks, how can children be poorer than the adults to whom they are connected? Um, well, this is because uh, the, the data here presented looking at um, children um, and uh, it's the overall population includes the children. So um, if we look at adults in households with children, their poverty rates would look similar to the children, if that makes sense. Because the, the poverty measure is calculated for the, uh, whether someone's poor or not is calculated at the family level. So everyone mm -hmm. in the family is considered to be poor. We compare the resources that all of the um, people in that family have to the threshold for that whole family and then everyone in that family is considered poor or non-poor. Thank you. Um, an another question, um, another person is wondering whether the supplemental poverty measure has been used in other contexts, you know, other countries. Um, they particularly mention Brazil or Latin America, uh, but other places in the world. Um, well, the, the supplemental poverty measure itself is, is specifically designed for the United States context, so it's, it really looks at particular safety net programs that are included in the United States and looks at particular kinds of um, expenses that people have in the United States, like um, paying, paid child, child care costs and those kinds of things, or paid out-of-pocket medical expenses. Um, so the SPM itself can't be used in, in other countries, but um, certainly a similar approach could be taken in other countries, and I, there are a variety of different approaches that different countries have taken to, to measuring poverty. Um, that are they're very different from our official poverty measure here in the United States. So I know, for example, in Mexico, they use a, a multidimensional um, measure of poverty that, that looks at not just income and resources, but other things like education um, and the, those sorts of other aspects of disadvantage. So 
um, while the SPM itself hasn't been used in other countries, there are definitely other interesting ways of, of looking at the problem of poverty that have been used internationally. And there's no reason you couldn't use the SPM approach in any other national context, but you would just want to think carefully about what are the resources that people um, spend on their, you have available to them to spend on their basic needs, and what are the expenses that, um, that they would incur um, before being able to pay for those basic needs. Okay. Thank you. And there are several questions about um, accounting for the fact of whether or not people are eligible to receive benefits, but they may not, versus people who okay. actually receive benefits. And do the data that you're using account for the fact that there are many people who qualify but, but don't receive them? Right. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. So these data rely on what people report that they actually receive. So not whether someone's eligible, but whether they actually said, yes, I, I got food stamps, and this is how much I got from food stamps. Um, so, so um, uh, of course, one of the issues with survey data is we know sometimes people actually receive food stamps and they don't report that they do. So that's one of the, the areas that um, it would be helpful to have some more research to try to get some even um, more accurate data on whether people are actually receiving those benefits. But again, these data that I show you um, reflect only the benefits that people say they actually receive. We don't assume that people receive benefits unless they actually reported that they did. And I should say that um, we've done some research at Stanford with the California Poverty Measure looking at um, sort of hypothetically if you had more people take up food stamp benefits, for example, then how would that change uh, what the poverty rate looks like? And so there's some interesting analyses that can be done in that way to sort of say what's the, what was the poverty rate look like hypothetically if more people who are eligible actually did access the benefits they're eligible for. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, another question is um, whether anyone is looking at the pattern for looking at the poverty measure and applying it to a, a living wage. Um, that's an interesting um, idea. I'm not aware of um, specific research that, that that specifically integrates the SPM with a living wage, but it's um, certainly that, that certainly would be possible to do and probably would be valuable. There are some other kinds of um, approaches to calculating, like whether um, using uh, the, the sort of local cost of things like housing and childcare and food and those kinds of things, like self-sufficiency um, measures of of uh, of resources and expenses so, um, that are out there that aren't specifically linked to the SPM, but I think a, like SPM threshold would be very compatible with um, that kind of a project. So I think that would be an interesting, interesting area for, for more work. I'm not currently, I'm not aware of anything that's been done in that area, but that's not to say that someone hasn't done it, but it would be worth doing for sure. Uh -huh. okay, um, a question about whether there is a rate for families with children. Is there a specific rate? Um, a specific rate of SPM property or of um, mm -hmm. chronic or transient? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't, um, I don't have that um, right at my fingertips, but I have, um, I have definitely looked at that. Um, so mm -hmm. I could. We can um, post that. I, great. I can follow up with that. Yes. Terrific. Um, a question about, um, a couple of questions about the sample used in the research, the panel study of income dynamics. Uh, what were the demographics of the children and senior populations involved in the research? So the, the PSID is designed to be representative of the national population. So that means it's, a, it's designed to really capture what the population looks like as a whole at the national level. Um, and that includes, um, it includes um, the immigrant population. For, for this particular study, it, there's a sample of immigrant families that was included in the data I presented here. So, so basically the demographics of the, of the children and seniors look very similar to the demographics of the children and seniors for the country as a whole. And that's after using the appropriate statistical techniques to, to, uh, to interpret the data so that it is representative of the national population Great. using Thank survey you. weights. Yeah. So a, a somewhat related question, um, this listener wonders about um, but the fact that the survey data that were used start in 1998, and what about what would happen if you included prior years? Uh, 
Um, well, it, it would be very interesting to look at prior years. It's very challenging to look at prior years in this data because um, you don't have all of the, the data, the pieces of data that you need to calculate SPM poverty status prior to that year. So um, there are some ways of estimating those. Like, for example, um, uh, things like medical out-of-pocket spending weren't asked of people in this survey prior to 1998. So, um, so there would be some challenges in, in, in sending that measure further back in time. Um, it would be, I mean, in terms of looking at the SPM further back in time on an annual basis, there's um, an interesting study done by some researchers at the Columbia Population Center that, um, that extended the SPM back in time back to 19, the 1968, I think. And, um, that shows you the patterns in annual SPM poverty over time. I think an area for future research would be trying to extend the SPM back in time in a sort of in a longitudinal data set so that you could look at um, the persistence of, of poverty as well. Um, so with the data that's currently available, um, that hasn't been done. Uh, so that's an area for further research that would definitely be interesting to look at. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask two more questions, and, um, and then we'll let you go. Um, are you concerned that one outcome of your research will be a reduction in cash benefits? Um, well, uh, my the objective of my research is more to sort of look at the data and present the information. I think there are a lot of different ways that this data could be used by advocates with different kinds of perspectives or policymakers with different kinds of objectives. So. Um, I, I think the data do show actually that cash benefits play a very important role, especially for seniors, in reducing chronic poverty. I mean, that, that reduction in chronic poverty for seniors is really driven by Social Security, which is an important cash benefit. So, um, so I think, if anything, the, the data might support um, continued support for cash benefits like Social Security in terms of their ability to reduce chronic poverty. Okay, a question about Social Social Security was raised. Uh, should Social Security be counted as an investment? Social Security is not a government resource. Um, Social Security represents money paid into a government-sponsored retirement investment, to some extent. Um, do you have a thought about that? Um, I think that's where it does get into the issue that the, the poverty situation of seniors is complex and requires some additional thought. So um, I think... Um, while Social Security is uh, is funded by contributions that people have made, there is also a redistributive aspect of it. So people who had lower earned lower wages when they were younger receive more out of the the pot of Social Security than people who earned higher wages when they were younger compared to how much they put in. So there is it's not a straight savings account, but there is some redistribution as well. But um, I think it does. It, it, that does tie into the issue that um, thinking about um, the the senior situation carefully is important. I think it also. I mean, it also is maybe relevant to say that all government benefits are paid for by taxes. So um, while Social Security and other social insurance programs are linked to funds that the beneficiaries have actually put in, in fact, um, all of the government programs are paid for by taxes that are paid by all Americans. So, um, so that's sort of the nature of, of government support overall. But again, yeah, the issue of seniors and, and their resources is important to think about carefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very complex questions. Um, and we have a number of requests for the PowerPoints and for additional um, resources. So we will uh, be posting all of this um, on the SSRC, the Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouse, um, as soon as they are available. And I want to thank everyone for joining us, and particularly thank Sarah for her excellent talk and for, to Bill O'Hare uh, for his role as discussion. Thank you so much. Welcome. Goodbye, everyone. That does conclude today's presentation. Thank you for your participation.